All right, everybody. Welcome to the second day of adventures in the theoretical sciences and the second half of Vladimir's lectures. In part one, he gave an overview of classical Q-body chaos, as far as I remember. And I'm guessing today he will jump into more recent progress in the quantum domain. Um, before we continue, I'd like to remind everybody that this school is an experiment and we very much welcome feedback from participants that may help us improve its flow in the coming weeks. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> that's not helpful, but thanks. <laughs> As in, we'd like, you know, uh, criticism and constructive feedback. Anyhow, but yes, thanks for any feedback. Uh, all right, Vladimir, you, has the, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Um, so this is the title slide. Uh, so uh, as, as, as yesterday, there'll be a break from questions from 11.50 to 12. And I'll also occasionally pause to check if there are questions about every 15 minutes. And please keep the microphone muted at all other times, unless asking a question. Uh, the lectures are being recorded and will be placed online. Uh, the, the lecture from yesterday, as well as the slides from yesterday and today are both already online. So to, to remind you of, of, of lecture one briefly, if you weren't at the first lecture, um, this one will still be uh, comprehensible. Uh, we, we went back to the 1960s when Lorentz was interested in the weather and Lorentz created a simplified model, uh, which only had three, three variables. Uh, and to, to much surprise, that model already uh, displayed chaos and looked uh, completely unlike um, integrable systems. Uh, Lorentz found that it was chaotic, there was extreme sensitivity to initial conditions, and the trajectories in phase space settled down to uh, a pair of butterfly wings, uh, a strange attractor, a, a fractal type shape, um, then Lorentz noticed that uh, if one looks at the local maxima of one of the variables z, then that value predicts the next local maxima, like when one reaches the top of the wing to an excellent approximation. And so he constructed a discrete map. So from, from this uh, set of three differential equations, he went to a discrete map. Uh, and in the discrete map, it's very obvious that the system is chaotic. And so then we discussed for a bit some simple discrete maps, such as the tent map, uh, and they nicely illustrate stretching and folding, which, which are the hallmarks of chaos. We then moved on to a, a, a more physical example of pinball scattering, uh, slightly more physical. Physical One has three disks and one scatters, uh, one sends in a, a particle and looks at the angle at which, at which it leaves. And that uh, we saw a plot is, is highly erratic. It's very sensitive to the impact parameter. And uh, a way of understanding that is that there exist uh, impact parameters which cause the ball to spend an extremely long time in between the three disks, bouncing around between the disks. And uh, the, number, the number of different uh, trajectories that it could take grows exponentially with the number of disks that are hit, because just the number of words you can form from these uh, three symbols, one, two, and three, labeling the three disks. Um, Okay. Uh, and then finally, uh, finally to wrap up classical chaos, we, we, we discussed the KAN theorem. So there was the question of, of, an int of, for integrable systems, we know that the motion in phase space is on regular periodic trajectories uh, on toroid that fill only a small fraction of phase space. We also know that for ergodic, highly chaotic systems, uh, starting with some initial conditions, that trajectory will fill all of phase space eventually. And so these are two very different, very different motions in phase space. And the question was, what happens in between? So if one takes an integrable system and then slightly perturbs it, what does a trajectory in phase space look like? And we saw an example with the Keenan Heil system. And in short, depending on the initial conditions, some of those uh, tori uh, can be destroyed. Uh, so for some initial, so depending on the initial conditions, one has particular frequencies. Uh, frequencies for motions around the tori, and for certain frequencies uh, under the perturbation, those, uh, those tori get destroyed, and then those trajectories start wandering over a larger portion of phase space. 
And this was made precise in the KM theorem. We then slightly touched on, on quantum chaos. Uh, one concrete, concrete question was, so in, in quantum mechanics, we know that there we're interested in the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of, of the Schrodinger equation. Uh, but we know that, so solving the Schrodinger equation is usually hard. And um, one of the first things we learn in quantum mechanics is that in the semi-classical limit, one can use Bohr-Sommerfeld, one doesn't need to solve the Schrodinger equation. Uh, one can use Bohr-Sommerfeld to obtain the energy levels for Sommerfeld or WKB. And this expresses uh, the spectrum of energy levels, the high energy ones in terms of classical uh, orbits. And one, one implicit, uh, one implicit assumption of Bohr-Sommerfeld is that one has an integrable system in order to form that integral integral PD, PDQ of, or, around the, the torus. And so then there's a very real question, if the system is not integrable, if it's chaotic, what replaces Bohr-Sommerfeld? What's the analog of, of a trace formula that relates um, the quantum spectrum to some classical, to classical trajectories? And this was first, first, were, first, um, first given by Gutzwiller a long time ago, and now and since then more explicitly in, in um, using periodic orbit theory uh, and the people studying those have now precise, um, precise ways of, of, of quasi-analytically uh, computing the spectrum of some few body quantum systems using classical, using, uh, classical trajectories even for, for chaotic systems. And then finally, we, we ask the question if one just has some quantum system, uh, what properties does it have? If it's chaotic, what properties? Are there universal properties that it has? And we discussed the conjecture of B, G, and S. And their conjecture was that if one has uh, a classical system and quantizes it, then the, the spectrum, then the fluctuations in the spectrum of energy levels will look like that of random matrices. So in particular, the distribution of, of nearest neighbor level spacings look like that in random matrix theory. So this is something universal. One can say uh, potentially about any, uh, any chaotic quantum system. I have a quick question before you move on. Yes. To more complicated. And, and maybe the, uh, this was touched on in the discussion yesterday, but I, I, maybe I wasn't as focused. Um, when one looks at the KM theorem, it has a flavor of establishing a domain, a finite, domain of stability about the integrable starting point. And so the question that was never quite clear to me is whether there is a threshold that one should have in mind. And if there's a threshold to the perturbation, whether KM theorem essentially guarantees that there is some sharp, some kind of a dyna sharp dynamical transition from non-chaotic behavior to chaotic behavior. Is this um, something that's clear or? My interpretation was that precisely that it's not sharp, that, um, that uh, nothing sharp happens. It's just, so you pick, you perturb, you have an integral Hamiltonian, you perturb with some integrability breaking term in the Hamiltonian with some epsilon. And if epsilon is really small, then there are a few tori that get destroyed. So for most initial conditions, the motion looks integral, but then there are a few very special ones where it doesn't. And as you take epsilon to zero, uh, all, nearly everything uh, looks integrable. So it's a very smooth uh, kind of thing. So if, I if I wanted to look at it statistically, at any finite epsilon, there will be a finite fraction of phase space that's non-chaotic. Exactly. And, and so one, one could sort of think of it as statistically as a rebalancing of how much. And, but eventually when you enter the fully chaotic regime, yeah, I guess maybe that, that may be model dependent, whether they're remaining integrable. Sort yeah, of a, so a, I, I think the, um, so in, in the paper by Hinon and Hiles, they in fact have such a plot where they plot the, mm -hmm. as, uh, as they increase the energy, which is, which is a equivalent to increasing epsilon, they have a plot of the fraction of phase space that lies along regular trajectories and the fraction that lies along scattered points, the ergodic ones, and it's, it's aligned. But I should point out that their case was somewhat special because um, uh, when you have two degrees of freedom, the um, KM and other things are, are a bit different from higher because, because if you get, just because um, the dimensions are smaller, so you can get, uh, it's, um, 
it's easier to stay closer to integrable. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Good. So, so um, many, many of um, when we started motivating chaos yesterday, many of the questions, in fact, all of them of interest were for many body systems or field theories. So Lorenz wanted to understand the weather. He came up with this three variable model as a simplification, found there's a further simplification to a one dimensional discrete map. So a natural question is, isn't it time for us to return to the weather? Um, in the first lecture, we also discussed elastic scattering of a ball off of three fixed disks. But the question we're really interested in is the scattering of a large number of balls against each other with none of them held fixed, uh, something like what we do in statistical mechanics. So how should we analyze that problem? Um, and it's, it's unclear how to, how to approach uh, many body chaos. Even, um, even making a plot of a phase, phase trajectory is no longer feasible because the dimension of phase space is enormous. So it's unclear how to even plot it. Um, and we saw that reducing classical few body chaos to its minimum, its essential features are stretching and folding in phase space. Um, like we saw in the Baker's map. In the Baker's map, uh, one took uh, the initial square, one uh, stretch, stretched in one direction, contract in the other, cut in half, placed on top. It was a, a very crude simplification of stretching and folding, which, which is universal to chaos. And so one can similarly ask, what's the essential description of many-body chaos? Because presumably many-body chaos, um, it's, chaotic. It, it's chaotic precisely because there are many bodies that are interacting. So I have to admit, I have nothing to say about classical many-body chaos. So in this talk, we're going to move on to quantum many-body chaos. Now, usually we expect that uh, the quantum problem to be more general and hence harder than the classical problem. Uh, so this seems like a strange thing to do. But on the other hand, some quantum systems have no classical analog. And so maybe they're simpler. So in this, in this lecture, I'll describe a simple and chaotic quantum anybody system, the SYK model, Sash Tepia Kitaev. And I think it's a bit like the Baker's map uh, was for uh, classical few body chaos. It's the analog for quantum many body chaos. So, uh, so the outline, so there'll be three parts. Uh, the first part will be on describing the SYK model. So the, the model just consists of, of a large number of, of fermions. Uh, which have quartic interactions between them, between any four. So we'll discuss that in much more detail. Uh, and the essential feature is that it's a simple chaotic model that's solvable, much like uh, these that we discussed yesterday. Um, then the second topic, the second topic will be um, on the question of, for a quantum anybody system, what we mean by chaos. So um, because we don't have motion in phase space, so I can't talk about stretching and folding in phase space. Uh, that would be somewhat reasonable to talk about for semi-classical systems, but we're going to be taking fully quantum systems. And so um, we're going to give a definition of, of what we mean by chaos. It's, um, it's not nearly the, the, full, the full solution to the problem, but it's a start. So this will be these out of time order correlators. And we'll review a, a bound that was derived a few years ago, a bound on chaos. So the out of time order correlator will give uh, what you might call a quantum layup and effect exponent, and there exists a bound on how large that can be. Uh, in classical mechanics, the layup and effect exponent can be anything, but in quantum mechanics, uh, there's a bound, like there is for, for many things. Uh, and the SYK model will, in fact, saturate the bound, so it's the most chaotic possible model. And then the third topic will be chaos in black holes. This, again, is something that was discovered only recently. So it's been known for decades that black holes emit thermal looking Hawking radiation, but it had been unknown where the chaos is. Um, indeed, if you perturb a black hole, it seems to extremely rapidly relax back down to equilibrium. So it's unclear how to see chaos. Uh, and so I'll describe this in some detail of how to see chaos. Roughly, uh, the statement is that if you slightly perturb the black hole, so throw in an extra quanta, then the Hawking radiation that's coming out later will undergo a large change. Uh, and then um, 
black holes also turn out to be maximally chaotic. Um, so this will be a very chaotic uh, talk. Good, are there any questions right now before we start? Okay, uh, are there any questions from yesterday either? Yes, uh, Adida. Uh, by uh, stretch, stretching and folding of sphere free space, do you mean that the volume of the ensemble gets stretched and folded? Uh, the um, the vol yeah yeah just the the volume uh, just the volume and face space. Uh, I, yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just saying. So if it's chaotic, then you expect that if you start with two trajectories in phase space, then they start diverging. Uh, because that's what we mean by chaos. So that's the stretching part. But then uh, one needs to remain confined to a finite region of phase space. And so eventually they need to be brought back. So that's the folding part. Thanks. OK, good. Let's start then. So, so to set up SYK, uh, let me remind you of, of a few things uh, that you already know, and then uh, very gradually we'll get to things that you perhaps don't know, but they'll look just like the things you already know. Um, so recall that in, in a harmonic oscillator, there are creation and annihilation operators, A and A dagger, uh, that they don't commute, they have the commutation relation A dagger equals one. And using A and A dagger, we can construct a basis of states. So we act A dagger to the N on the vacuum, uh, and N is, is uh, an A integer. And this gives us a basis, basis of states. Um, this is, of course, very familiar. And, but to see this, um, note that the number operator is A dagger A. The vacuum is defined as being annihilated by the annihilation operator, A of 0 is 0. And, uh, so now we can act with, to check if that what I said is true, we can act with the number operator. So acting with A dagger A on the, on the vacuum gives zero because A annihilates the vacuum. Acting with N A dagger A on the first excited state A dagger zero, we use the commutation relation to commute uh, A and A dagger. That gives one and so we get A dagger of the vacuum and so on. So one can check that this is true. So, so that was bosons. So now uh, let's do fermions. So fermions, unlike bosons, instead of commutation relations, they anti-commute. So uh, now the creation and annihilation operators will be C and C dagger instead of A and A dagger. And they'll anti-commute. So C, C dagger will be one. So now there's a plus sign instead of a minus sign. And uh, C and C anti-commute with each other and C and C dagger anti-commute with each other. So what this means is that there are only two states in the basis, uh, the state zero and the state one. And the action of creation annihilation operators is the following. So C annihilates the vacuum like before. C dagger raises the, the state zero to the state one, but then acting with C dagger on that uh, annihilates it again because C dagger squared is, is zero. Um, so we can't go any higher, so there are only two states. And the number operator is again C dagger C, uh, which you can check. You can check what I said is true, that acting with C dagger C on the state one, uh, you anti-commute through and you get that one with a coefficient of one. So the Hilbert space is just two dimensional. There are only two states, zero and one in the basis. So to, to summarize, uh, for bosons, um, so bosons is what we discussed in the beginning. There's uh, the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional and to recover classical physics, we know that we need to go to high occupation number so that the energy is large in, in units of H bar. More precisely for, for a harmonic oscillator, we usually take coherent states, either the alpha A dagger N acting on the vacuum, which are a superposition of states of all occupation numbers. So this is um, how we uh, normally recover, or at least in, in the case of a harmonic oscillator, how we recover classical behavior from 
the, the quantum case. So we take coherent states which involve very high occupation numbers. Uh, and so for fermions, it's clear that there's no classical limit because the Hilbert space is two dimensional, so we can't go to high occupation numbers. On the other hand, fermions are simple because the Hilbert space is only two dimensional. Uh, so, so that's why we're going to be discussing fermions because they're simple because the Hilbert space is only two dimensional. So um, to make things more interesting, so, so far I, I've done almost nothing. To make things more, uh, ju just to state where we're going, we're going to try to build some interesting Hamiltonian from, from fermions. And so I'm going to do that gradually. So to make things slightly more interesting, we can have two sites and we label the sites by one and two and each site can have or not have a fermion and the creation and annihilation operators at each site are independent. So there's again, C and C dagger, but now there are two C and C daggers with indices I and J, where I and J run from one to two uh, with anti-commutation relations like these. So here are the two sites. And the Hilbert space is now four dimensional because each of the two sites can either have uh, be occupied or unoccupied. So there's a choice of a zero or one. And um, if we like, we can have a Hamiltonian in which there's a hopping term. Uh, so C1 dagger C2. So this annihilates a fragment at site two and creates one at site one and the Hermitian conjugate. And that's pretty much all we can do uh, with two fermions, two sites. Any questions so far? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. So, the CI, CJ, whatever, it's like a simple, what they are, operator, what? <laughs> operators, yes. Okay. So they are operators, and this is the way that they act to each other. And the Hilbert okay. speed, when you say zero, zero, is they generated by those guys or they are this four, it's a four dimensional, what is it? Yeah, I, I uh, so in the case of one fermion, the Hilbert space was, was two dimensional. The, the base is just, just two states, zero and one. Uh -huh. And then the C and C dagger just move you between the two states. Okay, good. And now when I, when I introduce two fermions, the, uh, the first zero one indi indicates the first fermion. So uh, the state zero zero, uh, so so the state zero one you act with C one dagger on zero zero, and the state one zero you act with uh, C two dagger on zero zero, and one one you act with C one dagger C two dagger on zero zero. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Good. Um, so. Now I'm going to continue making things more complicated and introduce n sites. So the anti-commutation for the CC dagger operators is the same as before, but now i and j run from one to n. And the Hilbert space is now two n dimensional because there are n sites and e each one can either have or not have a fermion. And now there are many different interactions we could take. Uh, so, um, so the SYK model or the, so we're going to try to construct a model of quantum anybody chaos. So I've now introduced N. So we're going to have N bodies. And now the question is which interaction should we take? And with N fermions, there's potentially very many interactions we could take. So we need to pick the right one. Uh, so let's just start listing off what's possible. So we could have a hopping term between neighbors. Um, this would look like CI dagger CI plus one plus the Hermitian conjugate. Uh, so we just, in, in this picture, uh, you just hop from here to here or from here to here and so on. Uh, so, so that would be a local Hamiltonian. On the other hand, we could have a hopping term between any, between everyone, CI dagger CJ. So a uh, fermion can hop from any site to any other site. Um, but we don't have to choose uh, everyone to be equal. So we could write a general hopping term with uh, coefficients JIJ where JIJ can be anything that we like. So this is the most general uh, two-body Hamiltonian. A more interesting, so this is still not a particularly interesting interaction. A more interesting interaction is one that involves four sites simultaneously. So we will move fermions from, from some two sites to two other sites. So for instance, we can have a term that only affects the first four sites 
C1 dagger, C2 dagger, C3, C4. So we annihilate fermions at sites three and four, if there are fermions there. If there aren't fermions there, then this just kills the state. And we create fermions at sites one and two. And again, the most general foresight uh, Hamiltonian is, is of the following form, where J, I, J, K, L are some coefficients, which are anything that we like. Any questions? Why um, the behavior is different when you have two to four? It's going. Ah, why is four more interesting than two? Uh huh. <laughs> ah, because uh, because two, uh, I could do a I could effectively do a change of variables. So this 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 is quadratic. So I could do a change of, of variables. So I could rotate the C's so that this becomes diagonal, and then the Hamiltonian is just a free free for a bunch of free fermions. So that's why two is not interesting. Um, but right now I'm just trying to list off everything. Um, uh, so that, then there's four. And uh, I could also keep going. I could have uh, an interaction term that involves six sites. So we annihilate on three, create a three others, and include the Hermitian conjugate with any couplings that we like. Or we could have a term with eight sites and so on. Uh, we could also take a superposition of terms involving different numbers of sites. So uh, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's clear that there are so many terms because uh, it's an n-dimensional Hilbert space, so we can choose for the Hamiltonian any Hermitian matrix, any n by n Hermitian matrix that we like uh, by writing it, by presenting it, by splitting it up into two-site or, or four-site or six-site interactions. I've just uh, uh, split up the Hilbert space in this particular way, which, which is physically uh, reasonable. But it's clear that there are many Hamiltonians that we can have because we can just write down any permission n by n matrix. Now, um, I think we would expect that most Hamiltonians that we pick will have complicated dynamics and be chaotic. Um, at this stage, we have not yet said what it is meant by chaotic. Um, but intuitively, we would expect this to be true. But at the same time, we expect that for most Hamiltonians, we will be unable to gain any, any analytic understanding of the dynamics. So if we, if we wrote down just some of the four-body or six-body Hamiltonians I presented earlier and wanted to solve for the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, this would be challenging. And so the key uh, for us is going to be to find something that's both chaotic and simple. Uh, so that's the challenge. Good. Are there any questions? Is the uh, is the problem clear? Okay. So the problem was was uh, solved by Kitaev. Um, um, so. Is this the model that, that solves the problem is, is the SYK model, Sash Um it's, it's similar to a model that Sash and Yes studied for different purposes uh, in, the, in the 90s. And the Hamiltonian is this. So it's, it's the interaction is four body, but that's actually not important. One could take six or eight uh, or anything higher. So it's, it's a four body term. So CI dagger, CJ dagger, CK, CL with these uh, coefficients J, I, J, K, L. So this looks just like what, what we wrote on a previous slide. So the interactions involve four sites at a time, something we already discussed. And the important choice, uh, as we mentioned, is what the couplings J, I, J, K, L are. So that I haven't said yet. Uh, but in order to have a chance of being solvable, there needs to be some kind of symmetry. But not symmetry in the way we're used to, because we don't want to make it integrable. Um, So the, the choice that's going to be made is, is, um, is somewhat unexpected. We're not going to choose the JIJKLs, the couplings, to be some fixed numbers as we would normally do in quantum mechanics. We'll instead choose them to be random. So they're going to be uh, complex independent Gaussian random cu couplings. Uh, so each JIJKL for each uh, index IJKNL, each of the indices runs from one to N, uh, 
as you can see here, we're going to pick, pick those from a, a Gaussian distribution. And so a Gaussian distribution, the mean will be zero and the variance will be J squared. So, so that's the, the system we're considering. Um, so we're not taking a, a fixed Hamiltonian, we're sort of taking an ensemble. Or one could say we have disorder, disordered couplings. Yes? So you were, so first when you were was only the C shape by itself, so you have their linear operators. Now uh, they're, so but then you have this, uh, so they are no more linear anymore, but now it's like they are random. So will you say that they are random uh, Hamiltonians in the one that you are building? Good, good, good. So, um, so it's, uh, that's right, that's right. So, but I'm going to make, um, one should, I'm going to make a comment later on the randomness. One should, uh, one should not pay too much attention to the randomness. Um, it's only important as a trick for solvability. It's not, so physically one can think of, of the J's for many purposes, it's equivalent to just think of, of having drawn the J's from a random, from a Gaussian distribution for each I, J, K, and L, pick some numbers and then work with that Hamiltonian. Uh, so that will give the same answer as by just averaging over all the J's. So averaging over all the J's, we can compute, uh, we can do the computations, but for many quantities, we expect the same answers if you had picked some random J's, but fixed. So you, you say that you take a result for the aberration and this will give you a result for each individual. That's right, for some quantities. Okay, good. And Vladimir, um, yes. maybe you're going to get to this, but is there an intuition why it's end of the three halves is the right normalization? Ah, um, it is. Uh, if there's not, um, if you take any different power, then you don't get anything interesting. Uh, th that's the intuit. Um, th there's, well, presumably yeah. you want the energy to be an extensive quantity, right? Uh, that's right. But um, that's right. But the, um, yeah, the, uh, it's just, um, yeah, th there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing deep about the end of the three halves. Uh, yeah. But, but is there an easy way to understand why that's the right thing? Yes. You know, if, uh, I, if I do, right, the mean field ferromagnet, it's one over N, the mean field spin glass, it's one over square root of N. Good, good, good. So there is, ah, good, good, good. I can use the uh, annotate, just a second. Okay. Uh, uh, I should have used that yesterday for your question, but I was, un <laughs> I didn't think of it. So, um, oops. So there's going to be uh, the, there's going to be some, so there's going to be some kind of dominant, one can say interaction that we want, um, that will dominate in this model with this, these particular, particularly chosen coefficients. So uh, you first have, so you start with a single fermion, then you add, act with this interaction. So it, it, so you go from one to three because this, um, yes. this has four fermions, uh, and then you go back to one, um, and so each interaction vertex has has a, um, a a j here. So you pick up a one over n to the three halves here, and a one over n to the three halves here, and then there's a sum uh, of of the indices here. So there there's an n cubed. Great. Um, but I I haven't explained why why we want this diagram to dominate, and I'm in fact not going to. Uh, but this is this is the reason. So it's not. So I guess what I want to say is it's not. Um, f from looking, from just uh, looking at the Hamiltonian, it's not obvious what I should have put. Uh, at least to me, it's not obvious that I should have put this normalization, but um, it ends up being what we want. Good. Um, good, so, so, and then the, the uh, there are some properties that the J's need to satisfy. So because fermions anti-commute, if you anti-commute, so if you anti-commute CK and CL, you pick up a minus sign, uh, but then you can change the summation indices, interchange K and L. So that means JI, JLK is minus JI, JKL. Uh, so that's by anti-commutativity of fermions. And then the Hamiltonian needs to be Hermitian. And so the, the couplings need to satisfy this property. So, so let me, um, 
let me give uh, a more intuitive picture of what's happening. So we said there are n sites and n is very large and there are a lot of fermions. So now I've drawn the sites as, as circles and each site can either be um, occupied or unoccupied. So uh, of course it's quantum mechanics. So um, the, the states are really a superposition of, uh, a generic state is a superposition of states of, of this kind with precise occupation numbers. But let me just look at one of these basis states. So I've picked some of the sites to be occupied. Those are the green ones and the others are empty. So those are the white ones. Um, and now we act, now we evolve in time. And as we do that, which sites are, are, are occupied or unoccupied changes in a particular way. So any two occupied sites can become unoccupied while two unoccupied sites become occupied. So for instance, uh, here I've made up some labeling for the site. So you can see that one and nine are occupied seven and 19 are empty. And if we act with the Hamiltonian, uh, in particular, the term involving the, the, the C's at sites one, seven, nine, 19, then we can uh, flip this and we go, uh, sites one and nine go from occupied to unoccupied and sites seven and 19 go from unoccupied to occupied. So if we go back, you can see. Um, so, so, so there's clearly, so clearly the dynamics is, is interesting. Um, in terms of, in terms of Feynman diagrams, we would, we would draw the following. So um, we would say particles one and nine came in, they annihilated and seven and 19 were created. Um, that's a bit, usually one thinks of Feynman diagrams as corresponding to actual particles moving in space time. Uh, and here there's, it's just sites. So it's, it's not as interesting, but we can still draw the same pictures. Although, Sorry. So yes. one question related to the previous slide. Yes. So will you say that your dynamic is a dynamic on the space of sequences of zero one into itself? Because it's like occupy zero or whether occupy is one and non-occupy zero. And so yes. this is space and you have two to the n places. So your space is a zero one up to two to the n and then your operator is acting over there. That's right, exactly. The Hilbert space is two to the n dimensional. We label the states by the occupation numbers of each of the n sites. Um, and then, and then th that's the dynamics. Of course, when there's only two options, zero or one. So that's right, but it's quantum. But, but again, uh, that, that's true for the basis, but even for a single fermion, there's the only option is zero, one, but then one can have a state that's a superposition, alpha okay. zero plus beta one. Okay, excellent, perfect. So in the basis states, this space, zero, one, two to the n, and they are the ocean occupy or not occupy, and then you have dynamic over evolving on this space. Exactly. Okay. Um, it's a superposition thing that makes it much harder than, uh, than classical physics. Good, so, so to, to recap, so the, the, the properties of SYK, the interaction can occur between any four sites. The coupling between any four sites is drawn from this Gaussian distribution. And the variance of the distribution is the strength of the coupling, which we're going to call J. So uh, I want to make a comment uh, connecting to random matrix theory. So SYK is clearly not a realistic, it's not a realistic model. There's no notion of locality because the interaction acts, it takes any four sites. Um, and we're used to local Hamiltonians, and this is not local. There's no simple way of fixing this. Um, the fact that the interactions are all to all is essential for solvability. That's what gives it this kind of symmetry after you average over the Js. Uh, however, one thing to point out, so in the previous lecture, we discussed random matrix theory, this idea that goes all the way back to, to Wigner, that if one has a complicated many-body Hamiltonian, uh, and one wants to get a sense of some properties of, of the spectrum, one can try replacing it with a Hamiltonian that's a completely random matrix. Uh, of course, it, this can only be valid to only so much because once Hamiltonian is never just a completely random matrix, there's more structure that goes into it. And so we can say that SYK is an improvement on just random matrix theory. So it's, it's random, but only within the four body uh, sector. So if I had taken a superposition of of terms with six body, eight body, each with random coefficients, then I would have formed a completely random matrix. But I've restricted the, the matrices to be of this form. 
So it's, I would say it's an improvement on random matrix theory, but not yet uh, the kind of local Hamiltonian in higher dimensions that we would ideally like. So another comment that, that Enrique already alluded to, one might worry about taking random couplings. We don't normally do this because the normal rules of quantum mechanics is you pick, you pick uh, a Hamiltonian uh, and then you work with that, you don't do averages. Um, in fact, the, the randomness of the couplings is not really physically important. Uh, it's just a trick to do computations. Um, and as I mentioned, many quantities are self-averaging in the large and limit when the number of fermions is large. So one could, would obtain the same answer with a Hamiltonian that has randomly chosen but fixed couplings. So one could try to numerically check if, if what I said is true. Um, but in any case, there are variants of the model which have no disorder, such as uh, the tensor model, I won't discuss it. This is all to say that um, when Kitaev initially presented the model, it was unclear if the disorder is actually important for the chaos, uh, but it's not. It's just a trick, as far as I understand. Uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, so the, the remarkable feature of SYK, uh, which I haven't shown, is that we can analytically compute correlation functions. So it's completely solvable in the large end limit. We can't analytically compute the spectrum of, of the Hamiltonian, but um, that would be asking too much, but we can, I think that would be asking too much, but we can analytically compute correlation functions um, of the fermions. And so I won't discuss this, but um, you can find it in, in the literature. So let's, uh, uh, so let's take our uh, 11.50 break now. Uh, and if there are any questions or comments, we can discuss that. Yes, Joshua? Yes, so I had two questions. Um, in the SYK Hamiltonian, if we include a finite chemical potential, would it be integrable? Um, so if you include the finite chemical potential, then it's just as easily solvable as it's still chaotic. That doesn't change it. It's just as e but it's just as easily solvable as without the chemical potential. Okay. Uh, would would it still saturate the bound with a yeah, finite chemical yeah, potential? Yeah, okay. I would. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And my other question is, um, I think back a few slides when we had the picture with the green and white dots. Yes. I think it was uh, yes. So. I th I've heard that SYK is basically a zero plus one dimensional model, right? But here it seems Correct. as if it's more like on a 2D lattice. So ah. if I, I've heard yeah. that like, if you want to actually like consider um, like an actual material, right? You need SYK islands. So how ca yeah, can we actually consider just a regular normal SYK as being actually as on a physical lattice as in mm -hmm. your picture? So the, so the reason, um, so the reason one says it's, so one can say it's zero plus one dimensional or one can say it's infinite dimensional. Uh, the point being that, uh, that the interactions are all to all. And so there's no notion of, of locality. So even though I drew it here, normally if I draw it on a lattice, you, you expect I drew it like that because there are interactions between neighbors, but not between like this guy and that guy. But that's not true. There's interactions between everyone. So that's why, um, that's why it's zero plus one dimensional. So you, so, uh, there were a number of, of papers trying to that wanting to apply SYK to, to condensed matter systems and wanting to get around uh, this problem that an actual system, the interactions are local. And so, like you said, one forms islands of SYK. So one forms, uh, one forms, one takes many SYK Hamiltonians each. So each, uh, we can call the quantum dot has N of these fermions. It's an SYK. And then, uh, so they have all 12 interactions and then one includes uh, an interaction term between the, between the islands. So one that, that uh, so now if we inc include the islands, then a Hamiltonian is, is like this SYK one, but now there's an additional sum and an additional index which labels which island we're on. And then we'll include an interaction term which mixes us, which will have a term CIA dagger, CJA dagger, and then CKA A plus one, CK. L A plus one. So it will, there'll be some hopping from island A to island A plus one, uh, but only that, not hopping from any island to any island. And this turns out to also be solvable and, and have many of, very similar to, to SYK. So really, it really isn't like a true 
condensed matter mo condensed matter model net would actually just be a normal S Y K system. That's, you that's always right. need S Y K islands. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. But, but those two have some. That too is not a an excellent model because um, there's still the large n for each of the the quantum dots, and the actual material one doesn't expect there to be any large n. Um, but this is the state of the art. Okay. And also, I noticed that there's always two flavors of SYK, right? And it's the complex fermion and it's the, and it's the Majorana. Yeah. So what would motivate someone to pick, say, one versus the other? And why do you take the complex fermion case? Uh, I usually take the Majorana case, but I thought for this talk, complex was easier. I, I, it doesn't really. So the, uh, the only distinction, so here I could have written, uh, instead of like writing CL, I could have written CL plus CL dagger. So I could call chi to be CL plus CL dagger and then just written an interaction which has four chi's. So that, that would be the, the Majorana one. Um, it's just the distinction like, yeah, using realer. There's not much, there's essentially no difference. Um, so why would someone say pick the Majorana case? Because usually I see the Majorana case in the literature, but I feel like the complex fermion case would probably be more realistic in a sense. Uh, you can pick either there, um, yeah. Okay. The my yeah. Uh, yes, Abhay. Uh, so if I understand correctly, for Majorana modes, uh, creation and annihilation daggers are the same, aren't they? That's right, because if you have chi as c plus c dagger, and then you take chi dagger, then you get the same thing, because it's yeah, in which case the number conservation will not hold here. Correct, correct. So in in this in this in this direct version of of SYK, you have number conservation, but in the Majorana version, you don't. So that's, that's a distinction. So then in, in the pictures I was drawing here, where I said that we start with sites one and nine occupied, seven and 19 occupied, and then they flip. In the Majorana version, uh, you could have, when the interaction acts, you could have just added uh, fermions at sites seven and 19 without getting rid of the ones at one and nine, because now the Hamiltonian has terms that mix uh, it's not just creation annihilation up here. Instead of each C dagger or C, we write C plus C dagger, effectively, which we call chi. All right, thank you. Uh, yes? Yeah, so I have another question. So I know that when they first tried to talk about SYK, one of the main things they were trying to push for was an exactly solvable model that had a linear and T resistivity. Now, so isn't there any connection between the power of the resistivity that is it going with t linear and t or t squared or t to some power alpha between one and two and saturating the chaos bound because you mentioned before not really including the chemical potential will still won't really affect it being chaotic or not Good. so do you think there is some connection um no so if um so instead of this so with this hamilton you'll get linear and t resistivity but if you take uh six, if you take the version of SYK where there's six fermions instead of four, uh, then the resistivity is something different. It's not linear in T, but you still saturate uh, the chaos bound um, and it's just solvable and so on. Um, so I, I think, so f I guess physically one wants to, uh, if one wants to get linear in T, then one needs to motivate why one is taking this, this uh, four, which I guess is, um, um, yeah. I'll leave that for others to motivate. Thank you. Um, can I ask a quick question? Uh, so I had assumed that the reason that we're dealing with an even number of operators was because of number conservation. But you just said that in the Majorana model, there wouldn't necessarily be number conservation. So could you have, is, is there another reason why we were restricting ourselves to an even number of operators in the Hamiltonian? Um, no reason. We could, uh, yeah, we could, like you said, we could take the Majorana and then, then it's not, uh, uh, then we don't have number conservation. Okay. I mean, there might be, uh, there may be reasons you would want to model that conserves the number of, that, that, uh, that has number conservation and then you would pick this. Uh, but if you don't, then you can pick the Majorana one. Yes, okay. Yeah, uh, wait, I still have a question then. 
I mean, if if they are the same creation and annihilation, so how do I interpret this particular operator? Do I mean that the four uh, particles have been created or destroyed or anything in between? So, so, so I didn't. Can you say that again? So, uh, how do I interpret this particular Hamiltonian? So, so if I have C I C J C K C L, all of them are the same. I mean, irrespective of the dagger is there or not. But uh, I just said. What do? I, yes, I see. Uh, let me try the text tool. So in in the uh, in the Majorana case, I would write uh, some chi i j i j k l chi i chi j k chi l and then um, and then the uh, a Majorana fermion a chi is equal to, you could imagine is equal to C plus C dagger. Uh, so I could define this as the Hamiltonian. And then when a chi acts on the vacuum, the you create uh, an excited fermion and, and so on, because the C annihilates, the C dagger creates. Um, okay, okay, yeah, fine. Yes, AMIT. Uh, can we study entanglement in the SYK model? Like entanglement between two fermion sites? Um, yes, you can. Uh, would, yes. would we have the same Hamiltonian? And because the, would we still have la random couplings and how would the Hamiltonian look like if there was supposed to be a uh, entanglement between the two sides? Good. So I, let me answer the following, which maybe is what you're asking. So um, if, so one of the, the points of having a chaotic Hamiltonian is we can try to understand how thermalization happens. And if we had uh, a normal Hamiltonian, then we would have said that, um, that if you look at the entanglement entropy of some of some region, then it if the region is small uh, and it's a generic state, then that should look that that entanglement entropy should be large. Um, and so, or one could uh, a more dynamical question would be that if you perturb the system somewhere, uh, then you look at how the entanglement entropy in some region grows with time as the perturbation spreads. Uh, and so then you could try to study the same kind of thing in SYK. It's a little different because it's non-local, but you could look at the entanglement, with, uh, the entanglement entropy of some subset of sites and see how that grows with time, for example. So we would use the uh, same Hamiltonian and just put up the system with entanglement or? Uh, you mean, um, well, there are different things you can do. You can, you can take the Hamiltonian, you can perturb it with something Mm -hmm. with anything you like, but then you have to figure out how to solve it. Or you could take this Hamiltonian and ask for the entanglement entropy of various sites in particular states. Uh, there are many choices. Okay, thanks. Yes, Benjamin? Um, so with all this talk of, you don't need necessarily randomness, you can change the degree of the Hamiltonian. Uh, what is it exactly that characterizes the SYK model? Um, the fact that you, one, that it's made out of fermions, two, that it's zero plus one dimensional, uh, three, you do, you either need uh, this Gaussian random coupling between all the sites, or you need the tensor model. Uh, so those are all so th there's, um, yeah, so uh, the, the Hamiltonians that, the SYK-like Hamiltonians, it's, it's, they're broader than this, but it's not anything. So uh, you need those elements. Okay, thanks. I guess the, to, to put it differently, there's um, the, the reason that there's this large space, the reason that I can easily say that you can change this from four fermion to six fermion and so on, is that there are particular Feynman diagrams in the large end limit that are dominant. Uh, with these kinds of interactions. These are the diagrams that are known as melons. So it's a very restricted kind of interaction that takes place. Uh, and as long as those melons dominate, we can sum all of them and compute correlation functions. And so there's this broad range of Hamiltonians, all of which give melon diagrams. 
but as soon as you lose the Mellon diagrams as the dominant ones, then um, then solving is a, is, is a whole challenge. Yes, Min? So my, my question is how that, can you comment on the energy of the system? Is it conserved? Um, oh, be, because the couplings are random. So is the energy not conserved in this system? I would expect, uh, uh, well, normally I would expect energy to be conserved. Um, yeah, let me say energy is conserved. Uh, Okay, thank you. <laughs> I mean, the, the Hamiltonian is time independent, so it has to be conserved. Um, yes. I, I, I'm a little confused. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little confused because, uh, because the couplings are well, because the couplings are random, the standard rules of quantum mechanics don't exactly apply. Um, anyway, uh, I think there's nothing I can add to that. Okay, um, good. Should we move on? Any more questions? Okay, so now let me uh, let me move on to uh, so so now let me move on to out of time correlators and a bound on chaos. So the um, so I said SYK is chaotic, but I didn't exactly say what what is meant by chaos, um, and uh, I don't think there's a particularly uh, there's anywhere close to a full answer. But uh, let me outline what there is. So um, in single body quantum mechanics, when we, when we quantize uh, a classical system, we know that we can recover the classical limit by, by forming wave packets of high momentum modes. And this then provide, provides a starting point for, for studying semi-classical quantum chaos. On the other hand, for a single fermion, such as the one we've been discussing, there's no classical limit. We can't go to high occupation numbers. And with, with Hilbert space that's of such low dimension, there doesn't appear to be any notion of chaos. It seems that there's just not enough room for trajectories to diverge exponentially. Um, so, so this sounds like, uh, like a problem. Um, and and for, for a generic system, for a generic quantum system, it is a problem. Um, well, it's a problem if you're trying to study chaos in a generic low dimensional quantum system. Um, on the other hand, for SYK, uh, there are n species of fermions, there are n sites. And so uh, the individual occupation numbers can only be 0, 1. That's still true. But we can take n to be large. And with large n, one might hope it's possible to get chaos uh, just because the n could balance against the exponential needed for chaos. Uh, so as of right now, it's uh, I haven't said much of anything. I just said that. Uh, when we have chaos, we have something that's a large number, which is the e to the lambda t, the divergence of trajectories. Uh, and we need some other large number to compensate for that. And I'm just pointing out that if we have large n, then you can imagine there might somewhere be a 1 over n e to the lambda t, and then we have a large number balancing against the large number. Uh, whereas if n is 10, then there are no large numbers anywhere in this system. So, um, so for the moment, let's go back to, to classical, to classical chaos, and try to come up classical single body chaos and try to come up with a quantum analog of a Lyapunov exponent just for the single body quantum mechanics. Uh, so, so now we're going back to the sixties again. Uh, so in classical chaos, two trajectories that start out close undergo exponential divergence like this. Uh, 
delta x of t is delta x, x zero e to the lambda t. Uh, I should point out this is not quite the standard Lyapunov up exponent in that studied in classical chaos because there one, one does a time average because this local divergence uh, can change with time. So one does a time average of the whole trajectory. But for the purpose of the next five minutes, I'll call this the Lyapunov exponent. So um, good. So starting from this, we're going to try to form uh, some quantum notion of chaos, just from knowing this and nothing else. And so let's turn this statement into a Poisson bracket. So del dx of t, dx of zero, we're going to write as a Poisson bracket x of p, p of zero. We don't normally write Poisson brackets in this in this way because normally we take Poisson brackets of operators at the same time, or operators here, functions of x and t at the same time. But just think of uh, think of x of t as as being a, some complicated thing at time equals zero. Or just use the definition of Poisson brackets. So Poisson bracket of a and b is dA dx dB dP minus uh, x and p reversed. And if you apply this to x of t p of zero, you'll see that only one term survives with the first one and, and you get dx of t dx of zero. So this is a, a trivial comment. Uh, so now we've turned, and the reason I was interested in dx of t dx of zero is because that's what appeared here. If you divide by dx of zero, you get dx of t dx of zero is e to the lambda t. This is very heuristic at this stage. And the reason we turned it into a Poisson bracket is that we're taught that to quantize a classical system, we should take Poisson brackets and turn them into commutators with, with an h bar divided by an h bar. So let's just do that. Uh, so that's what Larkin and Ashchenikov proposed in, um, in several paragraphs in a short paper. Uh, so they proposed that the diagnostic of chaos is that the commutator grows, uh, grows exponentially with time. So by the above logic, if, if classically the system was chaotic, then quantum the quantum version of the system, the commutator x of t and p of zero should grow like h bar e to the lambda t. All I did was I, I said, so going back, we said dx dt grows like e to the lambda t. We turned dx dt into a Poisson bracket. This is still classical physics. So we say the Poisson bracket of x of t with p of zero grows like e to the lambda t. And then we canonically quantize and replace the Poisson bracket with a commutator divided by h bar and we get this formula. We, we don't yet quite know what it means. Um, the commutator is generally an operator so, uh, so generally, when we expect on the right hand side, it's not a number, but an operators. Uh, so to get a number, we need to compute the expectation value in some state. Uh, so we still need to do that. Uh, it's common to consider the expectation value of the commutator squared, um, because the expectation value of the commutator often vanishes. Uh, so one does this, and then one expects that that the expectation value of that grows like e to the two lambda t, uh, where this is some state which we need to pick, uh, and it's common to pick a thermal state. Good. That's the proposal. Uh, are there any any comments or questions on this? Yes, Pedro. Is it mandatory to pick the? Uh, I know the answer is no, but why would you? Why is it? Is it intuitive to pick the thermal state? Why? What does the the bibliography do? Good. Um, uh, uh, it's intuitive because it's uh, it's um, it's uh, simple. Um, yeah. The, um, uh, the 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 I guess a question you could have. Good. So in in classical in classical mechanics, we there we had systems where energy was conserved, and there we would expect different. They have an effect exponents for different energies because, well, energies don't mix. So if you have a trajectory in phase space, it moves on a constant energy surface. Uh, and so then it would be reasonable for me to say what the Lyapunov and effect exponent is as a function of energy. But in quantum mechanics, um, for a generic system, all the energy levels are discretely spaced. So if you sp totally specify the energy, you're just left with one state. Uh, and that's not so good. So that's why we're picking the, we're switching to the canonical ensemble. Oh dear, that generated three questions. Yes, Anand? Uh, so, uh, so, so uh, I wanted to ask you what the growing commutator value implies. And uh, so I would ask you that in the light of the fact that when, when we have a commuting observables, that basically means that the eigenspace is common, right? 
so now that you have non commuting observables does the fact that the value of the commutator is growing like there is an exponent attached to it uh, does that tell us something about the commonality of the eigen basis i mean can, is that is that some way to think about this at all i don't know that's that's interesting it's a bit different here because um good so we say normally to label a state we say we find the maximum number of operators that commute and then we label the state right. with your argument but here we're mixing things at different times so we don't normally okay. ask that operators at different times commute indeed they shouldn't because they're by heisenberg equations of motion they're all related so uh, right, right, right 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 yeah sorry yeah 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 you're right that makes sense thank you good. sure john I have a question about the interpretation of these things, but I'm not sure if I should wait until a couple of slides later. No, you can go now. Okay. Um, I know you have a slide on quantum mechanics being linear, not implying that uh, it's it, there's no chaos. Ah, uh, yes, from yesterday's talk. Uh huh. Um. So. I understand what the other time correlator is saying as something like if I measure this thing right now, it could have um, large consequences on this other thing that I measure later, but I'm not sure if that's a good interpretation. I wanted to hear your thoughts. Um, I guess one could have um, the interpretation I use is just uh, uh, I don't have much of interpretation. The only one I, I think of is, is the argument with the commutator growing. Um, one could think of it, one can think of it, uh, actually, let me go to the slide. So uh, uh, one could think of it as, 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 um, as making a perturbation. Of, so per perhaps one, one could think of it as um, you make a perturbation at some, uh, actually, let, let me leave it at that. Um, yeah, I just think of it as, as the commutator getting large, which it gets large. Yeah, I don't think of anything aside from this uh, analogy. Thank you. Uh, yes, Joshua? Is there a way to connect the quantum Lyapunov exponent to say uh, the collision integral in some quantum kinetic equation, since we can connect it to the commutator? Um, uh, can, can you say more what you mean? What's the, so I mean like in a in like a Landau kinetic equation, we would have similar like uh, Poisson bracket type entities in this uh, kinetic equation. So is there any way to like from these kinetic equations um, obtain say the, the quantum Lyapunov exponent for the system, or from like a Boltzmann kinetic equation? Mm -hmm. I think there have certainly been papers on it. Um, so the um, Right, right, right. Uh, so the question is how to to start for for a, if one is a weak coupling and one writes down some Boltzmann equations. Uh, in the quantum case, how can one express the the Lyapunov effect spotted in, in that line? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. Yeah, so there are, there are some papers on that. Good. Uh, okay, good. Let me move on. So so that was uh, that was just single body chaos, which which for the purpose of this talk we're not so much interested in. Um, good. We can extend this to, so we had X and, and P, but we can extend this to, to any two operators. And we could try to say that if the system is chaotic, then this commutator squared grows exponentially with time. Um, if we expand this out, then there are four terms. And the interesting term for our purposes is the one that's fully out of time order. Uh, V0, WT, V0, WT. Uh, two comments to make. It, it appears that until recently, uh, the OTOC, the out of time order correlator, uh, wasn't studied much. Uh, I'm not sure why. It, it is perhaps due to two factors. The first is that it's hard to compute. And the second is that for few body systems, uh, it's mostly going to agree with the classical result because of the argument we just gave. Uh, so to, to get a deviation from the classical result, one needs some, some kind of case in which um, in the, the quantum case, there are two classical, for example, two classical trajectories that, that uh, interfere, that both dominate the path integral and interfere. 
to get something that's very different from, from the classical case. Good. So the the so recently, so Kitaev uh, applied the out of time order correlator to a many body system. So in particular to SYK. So he, he took this this old idea and, and now is just applying it to to many body systems. And now one expects that one over n will play the role of h bar. So uh, as we saw in this commutator, there was an h bar in front of the e to the lambda t, which came from turning the Poisson bracket in, into a commutator, which, just to go back, which makes sense. There's an h bar here, which makes sense because the commutator can only really reach one. It can't go past one. So uh, to have an e to the lambda t, there needs to be a small, something small in front of it. This is the problem I alluded to earlier, and the small thing is, is just h bar. Uh, here for SYK, there are n, n fermions, and there's a small thing, which is 1 over n. Um, and, and the correlation functions are computed at finite temperature, as, as someone already mentioned. And so if one does this for SYK, which one can do because SYK is solvable, one finds that in the limit of strong coupling, this quantum layup and effect exponent is this precise thing, 2 pi k Boltzmann times the temperature divided by h bar. So at strong coupling, as, as the coupling goes to infinity, the coupling drops out and one just gets this number. So as I presented, this is just uh, a fact of what happens. Now, good, let me now mention uh, a bound on chaos. So classically, classically, one can have any layup and exponent. Um, that seems fairly clear. And so one can ask, is there a bound on the quantum layup and effect exponent? So we define the quantum layup and effect exponent this way in terms of the commutator and ask if there's a bound. So very naively, one, why might there be a bound? Very naively, one might say that uh, start with the energy time uncertainty relation. So delta E delta T is, is, uh, is greater than or equal to one. Um, and uh, taking, taking E as K Boltzmann times the temperature and delta T as one over lambda uh, gives that lambda is of the order or less than uh, K Boltzmann times the temperature over H bar. This argument isn't particularly con convincing. In fact, it seems a little more than dimensional analysis. Uh, so by this itself, one can conclu conclude much, uh, except that K Boltzmann temperature over H bar is what we got for SYK, except for the two pi. Uh, however, Meldesena, Schenker, and Stanford proved a precise bound uh, for quantum systems that lambda, the Lyapunov and effect exponent defined in terms of this out of time order correlator must be less than, than two pi K Boltzmann times temperature over H bar. And so SYK has strong coupling saturates the bound. So not only is SYK chaotic, it's maximally chaotic. Good, any questions? Yes, Joshua? Is that yes, a, so yeah. um, I know that a few years ago, there was another bound that was proposed based upon the uncertainty relationship in this viscosity of entropy. And since then, people have found that you can actually break the bound in numerous cases. So for the chaos bound, are there any examples where you can actually break the bound? Or is this a hard bound? Good. So the, the thing you're referring to is the KSS entropy viscosity bound, uh, which, was, which was, again, um, motivated from studying black holes. So this was a bound on the entropy to viscosity of any fluid. However, in that case, they never proved the bound. It was just conjectured. Uh, this bound was actually proven. Um, okay. But I, so you, 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 so you expect to never, ne people to never find any system that ever breaks this bound? Well, they made some assumptions in proving it. So if you, uh, if you violate their assumptions, then you can violate it. But to the extent that you believe their assumptions, their proof is just math. So. Okay. What was the main assumption? Uh, that, that uh, well, you can look at it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, Adida? Uh, when we uh, talked about generalizing from X comma, I mean, the commutator of X comma P0 yes. to any two uh, V and W, we have a certain asymmetry between V and W here, right? So how does, so, how do you choose? Does that have, does there have to be a certain relation between V and W, or uh, does the I mean taking W zero and V does that give a different exponent? Good. So one would one um, good. So one would so if it's chaotic, it should 
presumably be the case that for most, whatever most means, Vs and Ws, uh, this should be growing uh, or should be large. So it shouldn't be the case that uh, that some of, that the commutators of some operators are large and some remain small because then then it won't be really fully chaotic. Um, but but um, yeah, it's not totally clear to me what the precise rules are. Um, Oh, thanks. I think perhaps, I guess your question was, was actually better. Your question was how, suppose there are two choices of operators which have, which the commutator grows both. How do I know that the layup and effect exponent is the same for both of them? Why can't the layup and effect exponent be different depending on the operators? Um, I don't know what yeah. the answer is in general. All I can say is that in SYK, in SYK it's, it's uh, in SYK, it, it, it is the, if I take uh, the commutator of a single fermion, so a fermion four-point function or an eight-point function, it's, it's always uh, going to be the same. Uh, but in general, I don't know. Um, I, I guess people would say that the, um, I guess, um, I guess in the context of these uh, zero plus one dimensional models, uh, there's this, there's, um, yeah, let me, let me leave it at that. Presume, if it's to be the same, then there needs to be some sector of the theory, which is the one that's causing chaos. So some chaos like mode, which in, in this context, it comes from the Schwarzian. And then that would be, uh, that would be an explanation of, of universality, but it's un, like you say, it's un, a priori unclear if that should even be the case. So it's a good question. Yes, Saeed. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the, like a physical understanding of why this uh, upper bound exists. And what, why do we have such a such a bound on lambda? Uh, I don't have a physical understanding. Uh, the um, uh, in in the paper by Mel and Shanker and Stanford, they they motivated with a few examples of a ball in a stadium, but. Um, I don't have a physical understanding. It, it seems hard. So one can, um, one can try to come up with physical arguments, which are all variations of the energy type and surgery relation. But it's unclear to me that any of those imply a bound, because in these kinds of arguments, there's always some coefficient. So this is always up to order one. And it's unclear why, that, why one can't come up with more systems where that coefficient gets ever smaller. So it seems, so for instance, this entropy viscosity bound that was mentioned, they also had a heuristic argument. I mean, they had good arguments, but then they also gave a heuristic argument based on the energy time and certainty relation. But again, there's the same question that the coefficient could get arbitrarily small. So I don't, I don't actually have intuition. Um, if, if, or it, if, if lambda is larger than, I mean, if you like imagine a system with lambda that is larger than this bound, would anything be violated? Like any of the principles that we have in quantum mechanics or relativity? Um, I don't know. Um, okay. But it, the, um, I guess it would be, it would be nice if there was a different proof of, of the bound um, that's less mathematical. Right, okay. thank you. Uh, DW? Hi, is it, is it clear that this definition of the quantum Lyapunov exponent is the appropriate one? Like, are there multiple definitions uh, in the literature that uh, people are discussing? No, it's, un, it's unclear. Um, well, for the quantum Lyapunov exponent, um, it's hard to see what else one could do. But if, if this is a good definition of of chaos is unclear. Also, in, in the discussion yesterday, we didn't really mention, uh, actually, excellent. This uh, is well prepares me for the next slide. Uh, in, so in the discussion yesterday, we didn't really mention the up and effect exponents much, uh, because in the first lecture, we mentioned various methods of, that have been developed within few body classical chaos that allow for concrete computations and chaotic systems. Uh, but for quantum many body systems, there are none. Um, there, there, are no, there are no general methods. And 
one is able to solve SYK, but the way in which it's solved relies on what I would call standard large end quantum field theory methods. And for a more general system, they won't work. Um, so, so it's unclear how, how to proceed. Um, at the same time, it's, it's clear that, that, that strongly coupled quantum field theories produce extraordinarily rich phenomena, which strongly motivates studying chaos in them. Um, yes, so that's, that's all I can say. But so that concludes that section. So let's see, are there more questions? Or was that everything? Yes, Joshua? Is there any way to get experimental evidence of the bound? For example, is there any like thermodynamic signatures that one would see if a system saturates the bound? Um, ah, let's see. Uh, so to, so to, to actually measure the Lyapunov of exponent, to, to actually measure the out of time order correlator experimentally is clearly hard. Um, I guess well, for, so for example, like indirectly true, like would the out of time order correlator say affect say the specific heat of some good, material? Good, 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 good. exactly. So indeed, so one would like, one would like to relate. So for instance, for SYK and these uh, models of chains of SYKs, one can compute the diffusion transport quantities like the diffusion coefficient, something we in fact would like to compute. That was one of the motivations yesterday uh, and relate that to the layup and effect exponent. Um, it's not that surprising in those cases that they're related because in the SYK model, there's no parameters except the coupling J. So, or, or J or the temperature. So, um, but for a general, so there have been multiple attempts to derive um, bounds on the decay of a, of a two-point function, for instance, or something else. Um, yeah. But indeed, that, indeed, that's a good question. Um, Thank you. So I had um, maybe one more question about generally how to find Lyapunov exponents. So I know that when they were first introduced by Locke and, and Alvanikov, it was introduced in the context of, say, uh, superconducting theory. So I've seen other cases when people solve for Lyapunov exponents, quantum Lyapunov exponents, may, and they build a beta salpeter like equation for an out of time order correlator, and they solve for the poles. So, and this seems very similar to, say, solving the critical temperature in a superconducting theory. So, is there any similarity? conceptually or mathematically in solving for the critical temperature for a superconductor and solving for the low open of exponent. Um, so in general, I don't know how to solve for the Lyapunov of exponent. Uh, I only know how to do it in, in cases where the diagrams are, the Feynman diagrams are like ladders, which occurs in SYK in which you get this geometric sum, the beta salt period, as you mentioned, and then it occurs at the poles. Uh, so since generally I don't know how to do it, I, I don't know the answer. Okay, let's move on to the last. Oh, Benjamin. So uh, this condition of the Lyapunov exponent being positive, is it verified in the other cases, the known cases of quantum chaos in the spectrum of the Hamiltonian or the S matrix, the, the classical cases? Ah, you mean um, take, take something like Sinai's billiards or something that people uh, have studied a lot and compute the out of time order correlator? Yeah. Uh, I think one would just get the same answer as the classical one. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't know if anyone's done it. Um, I, I think all the interest now is many bodies. So, I, yeah. Okay, now the final topic is, is black holes. Oh yes, DW. Um, so you uh, talked about earlier how the, um, in the SYK model, uh, the, there's a, there was a concern that the Hilbert space is low dimensional and so maybe there's not enough room for chaos or something like that. Yes. Um, but then taking the large end limit helps compensate for that. Um, yet, 
you then said how this saturates the bound for the uh, quantum Lyapunov exponent. So does that mean that we should expect like a large class of systems that saturate the uh, this bound? Like if you are looking at a many body system of bosons or something where the, you have a higher dimensional Hilbert space, uh, should one expect that the this bound is also saturated? Um, good. So if one takes, um, one could ask the, perhaps you're asking the following question. So if one takes a generic system, a generic strongly coupled many body system or field theory, uh, what layup and effect exponent does one expect? Uh, so one could give uh, at least two answers. One answer would be that generically it saturates the bound, perhaps uh, more, uh, perhaps a more correct answer would be that uh, it's one gets something that's an order one number that's less than one times the bound. That perhaps that's the generic answer. Um, I don't know which, I th presumably the second one is, is more likely to be correct. In terms of, that may not be what you asked, in terms of the large n, so I should point out here, so this can only, so there's one over n e to the lambda t, so you can grow for, so for an amount of time that's one over lambda log n, this, this can keep growing. But once you reach a time that's of order one over lambda log n, this becomes of order one. And so then, um, then this approximation, the one I wrote on the right-hand side breaks down because then the commutator has become of order one. So then it stops growing. So there's exponential growth, but only for some amount of time until you reach this log n time. Um, so that's why you need, you need large n to be able to see chaos if you take, indeed, if you do try to do this numerically and take n equals 20, you won't see much because the period of exponential growth will be incredibly short. And so you won't be able to tell that you have an exponential. On the other hand, if you take n to be 10, 10 to the sixth, then you'll have a long period of exponential growth. Is that, is one of those two questions what you were asking or you're asking something different? Yeah, I think that's helpful, thanks. Okay, let me move. Let me move on to black holes, and then at the end, um, at the end, you can ask questions about anything. Um, good. Uh, so, ah, ah, there we go. so um, as I mentioned a few times, a remarkable recent discovery has been that that black holes exhibit exhibit quantum chaos and more than that they they saturate the chaos bound so they're the most chaotic systems in nature um, also unlike SYK they're they're real um, so th this is what we'll discuss next uh, so a star at a late stage in its life can can take the form of a neutron star and at that point there's inward gravitational force that pushes it in and outward degeneracy pressure from the anti-symmetry of fermions um, and if, if the star is sufficiently massive, then the gravitational force overpowers the degeneracy pressure and then it collapses into a black hole as is illustrated here. So here's the collapse into a black hole. Then there's a singularity in the center and then the, the green is, is the horizon. Uh, so now we have a black hole. And the only characteristics of a black hole are its mass, charge, and spin. And a black hole without charge or spin is a Schwarzschild black hole. And this is its metric. So the, the metric is, is, is measuring lengths. So G Newton is Newton's constant, M is the mass, mass of the black hole. And so uh, one can tell that if we take R to be large, then the, the thing multiplying dt is, is just minus dt squared plus dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. So at large R, we just recover the flat space metric, which, which is what we expect. If we're far away from the black hole, space looks flat. On the other hand, if we start approaching the horizon, the horizon is 2g, g newton times the mass. If we have an r and we're close to that, then space, space time becomes, becomes curved. Uh, one can see that, that the dt squared term and the dr squared term of the metric are multiplied by these factors. So time, time starts running differently. Uh, and the figure of that is, is this one, or the cartoon that I found online. Um, so soon we'll study the motion of light in a black hole background and see, uh, and see how it in effect seems to be slowed down 
when it's near the black hole. So classically, as is well known, nothing escapes, nothing from behind the horizon can escape. And this is easy to see. So let's look at the motion of light. So light moves along null rays. So ds squared is zero um, by definition. And so ds squared is zero then uh, if light is, if it's just moving in the radial direction, so I can drop the d omega squared, that's the angular part. And so I just have this plus this equals zero. Uh, and then I move that around to get dr dt is one minus two gm over r. Um, so uh, the speed of light has been set to one. So if R goes, as R gets large, so we're far away from the black hole, dr dt is one, which is what you expect. Uh, the speed of, of light we recover is one. But if R approaches the horizon, uh, the speed decreases and the velocity goes to zero right on the horizon. So that, that's why uh, if you're slightly uh, inside the horizon, then the light can't get out. Uh, any questions about this? So classically, so black, as is now well known, black holes are only black classically and quantum mechanically, the vacuum is an active place with particles and antiparticles constantly being created and destroyed. And uh, so this is sketched here, uh, particles being created and destroyed. If this happens on the black hole horizon, then one member of the pair so illustrated here falls in. So this is this virtual creation. Uh, and if this happens on the horizon, then one pair, one member falls in and the other one leaves. And th this is the, the standard cartoon of Hawking radiation, which is only partially true um, for an introduction symbol kind of book. So uh, in, in the seventies Hawking calculated the, so this is, this motivates that there's radiation from, from the black hole, um, quasi convincingly. Uh, so in, in the seventies, Hawking did an actual calculation for the radiation from a black hole. And he found that it emits thermal radiation uh, at a temperature that's, that's the inverse of the mass of the black hole. So he just computed the radiation coming out. And then using the thermodynamic relation D equals TDS, where the energy is taken to be the mass of the black hole, he found the, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. The entropy of the black hole is its area in, in areas of, 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 of 4G Newton, in units of 4G Newton. Uh, so area is just the area of the horizon. So um, this is all stuff from the 70s. And as is also known from a time period that if one perturbs the black hole by throwing something in, the black hole wiggles a bit and then it quickly relaxes back to equilibrium. And um, from the outside, all we see is the horizon of the black hole and the black hole appears to behave as a thermodynamic system. So it has temperature, temperature it has a mass, it has entropy. Uh, but this, um, this raises a question, which is that in every other context, we know that thermodynamics is really a result of some underlying statistical mechanics. Um, for, for, uh, for a gas of particles, we talk about its thermodynamics, but we know that there's actually a gas of particles, uh, actual particles, um, actual microstates. And so one could ask, what are the black hole microstates? Which is a question that has been asked for get decades. Um, so I don't know the answer. Uh, so we're, we're going to ask a related question, which is, is information lost? Um, so right now, this in the next few slides, I'm just reviewing uh, the standard uh, Hawking paradox and then we'll get the black holes because then we'll get to the chaos aspect. This is just to place in context um, the discovery of the chaos of black holes. So one, one can ask the question if, if information is lost. So if the process of, of black hole formation evaporation is unitary like every other process in, in quantum mechanics, it, it should be the case that in principle, one can decode from the Hawking radiation the precise state of, for instance, the star that formed the black hole. On the other hand, in Hawking's calculation, the radiation is exactly thermal. So that was the result Hawking got. It's exactly thermal. To do the ha calculation, Hawking made some approximations, semi-classical, but, but the approximations are valid. Um, and so uh, 
So there has to be some significant mistake in the calculation, but none has ever been found. And for several decades, there was the question of, of if black holes in fact violate unitarity. Um, so that, that question got answered uh, with the discovery of, of ADS-CFT, of holography, which I won't discuss. Uh, but the conclusion is information is not lost. Uh, and that's been the known answer for, for over 20 years. However, the question still, still remains of how to correct Hawking's calculation, uh, or even at a more basic level if, of how, how the information gets out. Uh, and the challenge seems enormous because if we throw something into, into a black hole, um, then, uh, then it just falls in and eventually gets to the singularity, which is at r equals zero, but Hawking radiation is coming out at the horizon at r equals 2m. Uh, so somehow the information has to go from zero to 2m. Uh, and it's unclear how that happens. But that's a very naive statement of the problem, but uh, that seems like a, a valid enough statement of the problem. Uh, and there was a resurgence of interest in this question as a result of, of what's known as the AMPS paper, which which demonstrated in a precise way that getting information out is even more difficult than had been assumed. Um, and as a result of that paper, it was then discovered that, that black holes are chaotic. Um, and again, this is something one could have suspected because chaos is intertwined with thermality. As we sort of mentioned, um, chaos is really the, the underlying microscopic thing that allows us to assume ergodicity and statistical mechanics. Uh, so one could have assumed that, could have suspected that black holes are chaotic, uh, but it's unclear how they exhibit chaos. And roughly the answer is going to be that throwing an additional particle into the black hole causes a significant change in the outgoing Hawking radiation. And so this, this question of how black holes return information has become intertwined with the question of black hole chaos. So, so let me, so a clear argument what I find to be a clear argument of, of how to see, very simply see the chaos in black holes was given by Polchinski. So uh, the last thing I'm going to do is, is, is just review what Polchinski said. Are there any questions before then? Yes, Joshua. Are some black holes more chaotic than others? For example, would a Weissner Nordstrom black hole be more chaotic than a Kerr? Uh, no, they're all... Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll, see in, we'll see in a minute uh, what controls the layup and effects, and it will just be the surface gravity of, of the. So, um, one should back up. So, there are many exotic black holes one can consider, but the layup and effects component will just be the surface gravity. Uh, so, once you know the surface gravity, you know the layup and effects component. Um, good. So the black hole is, so the black hole has now been reduced to this, a portion of it has been reduced to this um, uh, green rectangle. So we're near the horizon of a black hole and the black hole is emitting this steady stream of radiation. So um, it, we're going to say it's originating close to the horizon because we're standing out here and all we see is radiation coming out. And if we evolve it back, uh, for us, it just appears to just get closer and closer to the horizon. And the later the radiation appears, the closer it started off near the horizon. If we're standing on the outside, well, we're all, this has, sort of has to be the case because if we're standing on the outside, we know that nothing from inside the black hole can escape. So if we follow things back in time that have come from the black hole, the only place for them to go is near the horizon. But we're sort of mixing classical with quantum. Um, Good, so, so now we have, so we formed the black hole, it's sitting there, and now we throw in an additional particle. Uh, so that's our perturbation of the black hole, this perturbation of small perturbation, and we're going to try to see if that leads to a large change in, in the state to, to diagnose chaos. So we throw a particle in, that's the, the blue thing coming in. It, so the black hole absorbs the particle and then it, its mass now increases, so its horizon moves a little outward. So, uh, the dashed line is where the old horizon was and the, 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 new, the new edge of the green is where the new horizon is. 
So, uh, so the horizon shifted. So now the question is, how does this impact Hawking radiation? The fact that we threw in this extra particle and moved the horizon. Um, let me erase. It's unclear if I drew that or someone else. Uh, probably me. Uh, good. So if we if we go back, so now I'll have a few simple equations. If we go back to the metric of the black hole, this was the Schwarzschild metric. And recall that we said that the motion of null rays is, is along ds squared equals zero. So here's the motion. Uh, and then we can, we can in, integrate this equation uh, from, from some r1 to some r2 to, to find the amount of time it takes to get from one location to the other location, somewhere outside the black hole to somewhere else outside the black hole, we can just integrate this to find the time it takes. Of course, if there wasn't a black hole around, we would have said the time is just the distance because the speed is, is one, but space time is curved. So we have to do the integral to find the amount of time it takes. So we can do that and one gets some answer involving a log. It's fairly simple. One can simplify slightly by assuming that the quantum we're interested in started off near the horizon of the black hole. So it starts off at RS, which is RS of the, the horizon of the black hole plus delta where delta is small. And uh, the piece of the escape time that we're interested in is this one, the one that involves delta. So it goes like uh, one over the temperature times log RS over delta, where we approximated delta is, is much less than RS. So we have some light that starts off very close to the horizon and then it's leaving. And this is the dependence on how much time it takes to get out as a function of delta. So we're interested in this because uh, we throw our additional quanta into the black hole. Now the black hole radius gets slightly larger. And so that means this outgoing guy, uh, once we threw something in, now finds himself slightly closer to the horizon because the horizon shifted. So delta has in fact decreased. Um, and because delta has decreased, if you plug this into the previous equations, you'll find that this uh, Hawking quanta going out, it now takes him much longer to escape. The, the, the difference in the amount of time it takes him to escape uh, is, is delta RS, where delta RS is the shift, times crucially this exponential e to the two pi time times uh, the Hawking temperature. So the time was the amount of time it would have taken him to escape before, and this is the increase in the amount of time. So it's, all of this is coming from the fact that the, the metric, uh, that space time near the black hole is, is warped. And so uh, this small perturbation vastly increases the amount of time it takes for the quanta to escape. Um, and, and this is chaos. So if we're standing far away and measuring the quanta because it took uh, the quanta now far longer to escape, the sequence of quanta that we get at a certain time, what we expect to receive and what we're actually receiving is vastly different because of this small perturbation. Uh, because the guy that we were expecting to come at some certain time now arrives much later and instead someone else arrives in his place. So if each quanta you imagine carried some spin up or down, if we're standing at some time and measuring which spin we're seeing, we're going to get a very different answer just because we perturbed the black hole slightly. Uh, and so this, this we're going to call chaos. Uh, because slightly increasing the mass of the black hole, the small change in initial conditions caused this exponentially large change in the out state. Um, as a, perhaps as a very rough analogy, in the first lecture, we had this example of classical chaos where the ball with a particle bouncing between three disks and then escaping. Uh, so here there's, it's something like this where instead of the three disks, we have a black hole. Uh, so that's it. So that's, 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 that was Polchinski's argument for, for why black holes exhibit chaos, uh, building on, on the work of the other papers I cited. Uh, and so that's it. Uh, so that, that, concludes, uh, that concludes the lectures. So to briefly, let me give a two minute summary. Um, so the, lecture we discussed, in the first lecture we discussed some problems that were posed a long time ago, like how to understand the weather, how to understand turbulence and fluids and so on. Um, these were all, uh, one could say, classical many-body problems. They then, um, 
then to those are challenging to analyze. So then people started classical few body chaos, discovered that there's chaos even in classical few body systems. Uh, and so we discussed some of those. Uh, then we discussed uh, quantum few body chaos. Uh, we skipped classical many body chaos because I at least didn't have much to say and turned to quantum many body chaos. Uh, and we discussed this SYK model, which is a simple model of quantum many body chaos. Um, we discussed how in, in the quantum system, there's a bound on uh, what was defined as the quantum Lyapunov exponent. Um, and that the SYK model and both black holes saturate the bound. Um, and uh, some open questions of, there are many, uh, but some are finding uh, examples of simple and chaotic quantum field theories, um, real quantum field theories, more realistic ones that have space and are more realistic than SYK. Uh, what also appears to be lacking is a general set of techniques to, for studying chaotic field theories, techniques that are uh, unique to chaotic field theories, like, like were developed in, in classical few body chaos. Um, an analog of the KM theorem for quantum field theory would, would be nice because we know there are integrable quantum field theories, sine Gordon model and so on. Now we can ask the same question. We slightly perturb the integrable, uh, the integrable quantum field theory. What do we expect? Um, and more generally just having quantifiable characteristics of, of chaotic quantum field theories. All right, uh, thank you. And are there any questions or comments? Ah, yes. Uh, Pedro? Um, yes. Uh, in your Porchinsky argument, uh, can you say something about different dimensions? Because that exponential, that, that does that exponential behavior depends on the dimension of your black hole? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, Be because just... it came off as, a, as an as an integration on the function that you have and, and that changes with the dimension, the powers of R and stuff. So if it doesn't, it, it doesn't, but it was just an intuition. Uh, I see what you mean. Yes, that changes, but the, um, yeah, it, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, thanks. Um, Matteo? Hi, uh, sorry, I have a couple of questions that accumulated during the lectures. So first, as the SYK model have a spin glass phase or something like that? Because um, it reminds of the structure for the random couplings and the chaos and so on. Um, one of the points, um, good. So one of, the, one of the distinctions between the SYK and the because indeed the Hamiltonian looks not so different from spin glass models, if you're familiar, it does not have a spin glass phase. Um, okay. It may have a spin glass phase at, at, at extraordinarily low temperatures, uh, exponentially low, but for um, at any particularly one of N, there's no spin glass phase. Uh, and this was one of the one of the the modifications that Kitaev made to the Sashtipia model was that. Um, was such a modification to to clearly or at least heuristically avoid uh, a spin glass phase? Um, and second question about the the possibility of building a, K, a KM theory for for quantum field theories. I mean, in in classical in formulation at least, there is a possibility to write down the theorem as a, some kind of a renormalization group approach, where your fixed point of transformation, that in this case is the perturbation is the, the integrable, the, the, the harmonic oscillator. Is there, a, is there any attempt like that in for quantum field theories? I don't know, I don't know. Uh, okay. the, uh, the question of a KM theorem for quantum many body systems appears to be repeated many times in many papers, but uh, I don't know of any, of any answer. And sorry, last question, just because I know nothing of black holes, I'm, I'm a statistical mechanician. So every time that people speak about temperature in black, black holes, I'm not fully convinced for the following reason. That you define temperature normally in the, in the canonical ensemble, when you just have an, an, some kind of reservoir and a system and you take the derivative, I mean, you play with the derivative of the entropy and the energy and you find the temperature. While here it seems to me that normally you use the 
the opposite because you have the temperature and you assume that your relation between uh, entropy and energy are very dense. So as we show, you can have an estimation of the entropy. But I mean, clearly you don't have the axioms of, uh, of equilibrium thermodynamics because if you put two black holes together, they will not thermalize somehow. I don't know what happens, but I think that something, something different happens. So uh, my question is, I don't know, like, at the thermodynamic level, is there any kind of um, satisfa satisfactory explanation of, of this of this thing, or we should kind to build a new thermodynamics with new axioms? Um, so I have to comment. The first is I I don't think that I don't think that to find so in in books it says to define temperature one needs this very large reservoir and so on and so forth, but I don't think that's that's actually necessary. Mm -hmm. um, we can define temperature quasi locally. Um, the second comment is if um, one could have asked, so in just um, in these laws of black hole thermodynamics in, in the 70s, um, where it was stated that, so perhaps one of the things you referred to is that the argument that the black holes have entropy was kind of quick. I just said, well, well they have they have energy and they have a temperature. So therefore I applied D equals TDS. Uh, and then you could say, well, does it obey um, the second law of thermodynamics, for instance, like this example you said of, of, of two black holes merging, does the entropy actually go up? If I just keep using this rule, entropy is A over 4G Newton. Because if it doesn't keep going up, then maybe it wasn't really a good idea to call, to say that they have entropy. Um, and indeed it was proven that, that it goes up. So it, the second law can be proven. Um, for, for classical black holes. And there's been a lot of work in the, um, in the past several number of years of proving uh, uh, an analog of a second law of thermodynamics, but now uh, a quantum second law of thermodynamics. Um, Could you give me a reference for this thing that you're telling about uh, the entropy when you merge some black holes or in general, like it of thermodynamics entropy? Ah, uh, uh, if you look at Hawking and Ellis, Okay, the classic. Uh, math or, yeah, or any, they have very mathematical proofs or any, uh, yeah, that, that will for certain, yeah. Uh, yes, Benjamin? So when you show the divergence in delta T for, for the black hole when you throw in matter, um, so it, the interpretation of that is a bit tricky, right? Because in general relativity, that is just parameter time. It's not necessarily unobservable. I could reparameterize time, this T variable. And the, the, is the divergence sort of persistent in any interpretable way in terms of observables? Good, good. The time, good. So there are many different times. There's the time of the out of an observer. At, different observers use different times. So I was using the time I was using the, the time that was in that coordinate system, which is the time of, of an observer far away from the black hole. So we're imagining, we're just, uh, so we're just standing far away from the black hole and doing our experiments and we're the ones checking if it's chaotic. So we, we slightly perturb it, throw something in and then measure the Hawking radiation with, with our clock and see if, it, if what we're measuring changed significantly because we perturb it. So it's our time. But then chaos can be observer dependent in some sense, perhaps. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I don't know uh, how one would give a general definition. Good. I don't know how one would give a general definition of chaos uh, in um, in. Uh, in uh, in general relativity or uh, or relativistic systems, yeah, it was uh, this was uh, that's right. We, we just um, we took a setup where we know what we're talking about. Uh, you're right. This this um, this could be a, a problem more generally. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, there's a question by Chagini. Yes. Yes. Me. Uh, I have a question. Uh, if the changing of initial condition in black hole is not a small, uh, so uh, for example, uh, when two black hole merging, uh, is chaos work here? 
Um, if it's not small, well then what do you want to see? Uh, um, uh, if you make a large change in the... Uh, in, make a large, large change in initial condition, for example, two black will merge your ink, okay? And um, uh, is chaos work here? And uh, can we predict the time escape of the new black hole? Um, so classically, if, so if we just merge two black holes, then they merge and form a bigger black hole. Um, to get chaos, we need quantum effects. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm the, um, to see chaos, we, 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 the question is if we make a small change in the initial state, do we get a large change in the out state? And if you make uh, a large change in the initial state, uh, then getting a large change in the final state isn't, isn't impressive. Um, but perhaps you mean something different? Mm. No, no, that's, okay. it. that's it. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, John? Just a quick big picture question. Is there any hope in your view of coming up with some techniques that would allow one to calculate things like Lyapunov exponents in a general quantum anybody setting or probably not? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Um, uh, Joshua? I have two questions. So first, um, do all maximally chaotic systems have a grout ADS dual? Um, I... I don't know. Um, I would think not. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, um, well, as it stands now, we can, no, no, the answer is no, because, well, to have an ADS dual, dual the theory needs to be conformal. So I would, I would assume that um, there are non, -con I would assume that there are non-conformal systems that have, uh, that have ADS duals. Um, on the other hand, you might say that, uh, well, it depends how rare or how common you believe uh, maximal chaos is. If you believe that it's only black holes that are maximally chaotic, um, then perhaps you might be tempted to say that uh, a maximally chaotic system has a gravity dual. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. And my second question is, is any, is any case of say, studying uh, if sonic black holes or dumb holes, so maximally chaotic. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Okay. It seems like uh, questions have subsided. Um, so maybe uh, we should start by unmuting everybody and thanking uh, Vladimir. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming. We will we will reconvene uh, on Thursday, uh, a week from yesterday, uh, where the topic will be very different. Uh, we'll hear from Catherine Quinn about information geometry and uh, one learns more complex models. So thank you again, Vladimir. Thank and you. Thanks to everybody else.